the title of my message this morning is Recovery from Rejection. And I'll base it on the story of a man in the Bible called Jabez. So the title is Recovery from Rejection, the story of Jabez. Now, rejection is number one. It's a number one issue of most people who have emotional baggages of the past. Parental failings and experiences of abuse or neglect or mistreatment. Life journey in school, in adolescence as you're growing up, in your relationships as a family or as an individual, all these provide an opportunity for rejection. Actually, it provides for wounding, which gives place to deep roots of rejection and emptiness, a love deficit, a sense of worthlessness or lack of value. Now, once these ones are established, these roots are used by Satan himself to produce bad fruit in our emotional life, in our self-image, and in our personality. Basically, it causes wounding in your soul. And we read in Acts chapter 10 verse 38 that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. And he went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Notice what the Bible says. He anointed not Jesus Christ. He didn't anoint Jesus as son of God, no. He anointed Jesus as a man with the Holy Ghost and power. And because of that, he, had, he was able to go about doing good and healing all those who are oppressed of the devil. So that tells us that his desires is to bring healing from the roots of rejection and to replace them with the roots of love and acceptance from God. And this will produce good new fruit in our emotional life, in our self-image and our personality. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, it tells us what actually happens, how this happened. Jesus came to the synagogue and he opened the scroll, actually Isaiah chapter number 61, I believe. If you can give us, ah, thank you. And he began to read and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He had sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He came to heal the brokenhearted or rather the wounded. Now, what causes Rejection. And what are the effects of rejection? Now, rejection is the main element that wounds and damages the souls. And before accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior, our, our spirits were infected and corrupted by sin, which was introduced to the human race by Adam and Eve. And we all inherited that. So we were spiritually dead in sin. We were slaves to sin and controlled by it to some degree or another. But when we were born again, Jesus' death and resurrection provided us with a new spirit and a new nature. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, the Bible says, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is past. Everything has become new. In the book of Ezekiel, God gave a promise. He says, 
I'll give you a new spirit. I will replace your spirit and give you a new spirit. So God has put in us a new spirit if you are born again. Amen? So we are born with good and righteous nature of God in our spirits. But rejection is Satan's main weapon against our souls. Remember, like the Bible teaches us, we are spirit, soul, and and body. We are, we, we are actually like we are three in one. We are spirits who express ourselves through the soul, but we live in a vessel called the body. Amen? Amen. So when you get saved, your spirit becomes new. Amen? Amen? The Bible says we are quickened, we are made alive, new spirit. And that spirit is pure, is holy. It cannot sin. It's made in the image of God. Amen? Amen. And the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you by combining with your spirit and becoming one. So your spirit and the Holy Spirit become one. That's what the Bible says. So we are one with the Lord. So the Holy Spirit dwells in your spirit. And when we say be filled with the Holy Spirit, we are saying allow the Holy Spirit to have more control. Amen? So we are new creation in our spirits. But our souls, which is our mind, our emotion, our will, still needs to be healed. It has to be transformed by the new of your mind. There is a process. And because of the woundings that you caught in the past, Satan wants to use that opportunity. So he wants to convince you, despite being made in the image of God, that you are unwanted, you are unloved, and you are worthless because of what you've gone through. And you know parents who are also damaged by sin and who have empty and broken hearts are actually not capable of providing or giving their children genuine love and affection that they need. You see, we were created to be loved. From the time a child is conceived, when you are just but adult, tell your neighbor adult. You are one, sir? Adult. One cell combined with another cell and became one cell. Before it multiplied into two cells, it was one. From that point, you needed love. Amen? Because when you are conceived, God's spirit came and dwelt in you. Your spirit was born. And you needed to be loved. That's the basic requirement of a baby. From the time they are in the womb until they are born, and as they grow up, they were created to be loved and they thrive on love. They need love to live normal life. But you can't keep what you don't have. So children who are raised with a lack of love, affection, touch, safety, security, affirmation, motivation, forgiveness, will feel rejection. They will just automatically interpret that lack as rejection. And they will perceive themselves as rejected. They will define themselves as unwanted, worthless. In 1944, in America, they decided to do a test. So they picked up some uh, 40 children. And from the time the children were born, the only thing that they were given was they were fed and their nappies were changed and they were washed. Apart from that, 
they were not to be touched by anyone. And they had learned to do that trial, that test for a season. But in four months, half of the kids were dead. So they had to stop the test. 20 died because they were not touched. In India, the girl child is unwanted and considered a burden. Considered unwanted. In October 2011, you see, when a girl is born, it's a burden to the family because they have to feed, dress, and then even when they need to get married, they are the ones who pay down. So every time a girl is born, there's disappointment. There's regret. There's lack of celebration. And they give the child Nakasha. In fact, one of those girls, uh, who, who, who at that time was 32, she was called Nakusha also. She was a primary teacher. And she, and, and she, she grew up under that rejection because she was given that name Nakusha. And she was the third child, the third daughter. And you can imagine, first child, a girl. Second one, a girl. Third one, a girl. So she was the third one. Triple rejection, if I can use that word. And her grandmother and mother insisted on calling her Nakusha. So she said, I felt guilty about who I was all the time. When I used to introduce myself, People used to laugh at me. That's what I most remember. Feeling really hurt about my name. That's what she said. But thank God she was part of the 200 girls who went through that ceremony and she changed her name. So the heart turned her into a determined person, she said, and she resolved to move away from home and to prove to her family that she was not a burden or a curse. And she is the only member of this family who became a college graduate. You see what rejection can make you do? It can make you work so hard to prove something to somebody else. It can make you to do things in order to be accepted. The opposite of rejection is acceptance. So some, if you feel rejected, or if you are rejected for any reason, you will do things to seek acceptance. That's a normal human be, uh, uh, need. One of the basic needs for a human being is acceptance. Amen? Yeah, so it's really a challenge. When people go through rejection, they base their self-image, their identity, their sense of personal value and worth on these feelings of rejection. Now, Children believe everything that they are told, whether it's good or bad. That's why children must be protected. Hello? Before you consider starting a family, make sure you have the right environment. And the right environment means there will be somebody to raise up that child. Not a household. Hello? No. A mother. A mother's role is to take care of the child. So important. So anything you tell a child, whether it's true or not, whether it's good or bad, they will internalize it. And if you treat a child in a way that communicates rejection to them, they usually internalize it. They will define themselves by it. And it will become part of their thought life their emotional life, their self-image. And as they continue thinking like that, feeling like that, seeing themselves like that, it becomes a strong stronghold. It becomes a rejection stronghold. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, we have a scripture that says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down every imagination and every thought 
that exalts itself against the knowledge of the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. A stronghold was a castle or a, or, or a fortress from which a king with his army could dominate and defend uh, the territory around, around them. It was a high tower and whoever controlled the stronghold controlled the territory around it. It was the same way in the spiritual realm. Satan wants to control and dominate every part of our lives. And in order for him to do that, he must establish a stronghold in our minds. That's when he starts, a stronghold in our minds. So through this stronghold of your thought life, of your emotion, of your self-image, he can exercise a lot of control over your perceptions and your decisions. This stronghold is a lie that we believe and agree with, even to the point of defending it. Because it's become part of us. It actually goes into our subconscious. And anything in your subconscious, you are not aware. But you have programmed it through your continuous thoughts, through your emotions, and through your self-image, the way you imagine yourself to be, that becomes part of your subconscious. And your subconscious is basically what controls you. Hello? It's what drives you. It's the operating system for those who understand computers. That's the operating system that runs you. It's the one that determines your reaction, your will. It determines what you speak out of your mouth, what you believe in your heart. It's so powerful. So that's how the enemy comes, in order to exercise and control you, control your perceptions and your decisions. So this stronghold, like I said, is what we believe and agree with. It's so powerful, it's so important. And it's a belief that we base our lives on. Even though it's against us. Now this stronghold influences or even controls much of our thoughts, and much of our emotions, and our behavior. Our behavior. Now the very first stronghold that Satan wants to establish in a person's life is a stronghold of rejection. That's what he wants to do. He knows once he establishes that stronghold of rejection, he has controlled you for the rest of your life, unless you are set free. And that's why he starts as early as possible, in childhood, in infancy, even in the womb. And if he can get you to believe that you are rejected and unwanted, by the people who brought you into this world, by the very people who should love you, then he can control you all your life. Because you will internalize rejection. You will build your self-image and your identity upon that. And you will believe that you are very little worth. You devalue yourself completely until your will, your will is even weakened. And with this stronghold in place, it's an easy matter to bring other strongholds, such as fear, anger, pride, jealousy, suicidal thoughts, to come along. By the way, rejection which the enemy brings upon your life. It's not just rejection, it's actually a spirit. It's a spirit of rejection. And once you accept the spirit of rejection in your life, other spirits, other cousins of rejection will begin to come, such as fear, anger, pride, jealousy, suicidal thoughts. You know, I was thinking this morning, 
Why is it that some children, when they are born, they suck their thumbs? Ever thought about that? They suck who? They suck their thumbs. They are trying to comfort themselves. In fact, they, have, they, have, they, have, they even have devices, isn't it? For, 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 to keep the children to suck. That's a sign of rejection. A sign that you need comfort. You need something to, 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 something to hold you up. So you suck your thumb. That's a good sign of, of rejection. So next time you see your child sucking the thumb, find out what you are not doing. Okay? And the list is endless. But this rejection stronghold can firmly control your soul. And you become a puppet of Satan. He controls you through that. Even born again Christians. I'm talking to born again Christians. It's still an issue. Though your spirit has been born again, made anew, yet because your soul was wounded when you were young, Satan has a football there and he can still control you. And that's why this afternoon I'm sharing this because the Bible says that you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Amen? So you cannot allow the enemy to do that. As soon as you decide to rise up and move forward, God, uh, Satan seems to come and replay, press the replay button and you find yourself going back again to that stronghold in your mind. And most of the time it knocks you back again. You stand up, you say I will not feel rejected again, and you're trying your best and you find yourself going back again. That explains why there are some hard to break habits that we have adopted, apart from sucking our thumb. See, we suck our thumbs when we are young. Once we grow up, we stop sucking and sucking our thumbs. We adopt other things. And you find people are, who, are, who are into drugs and other things, you know. It's a sign of rejection. Isolation, for example. You like to isolate yourself because you fear to be rejected. You find people who don't want to tell you their opinion. They keep their opinion to themselves. Why? Because they fear Rejection. People fear rejection and because of that they cannot achieve their full potential. If I call someone right now and say, come here and sing a song, what would be your reaction? I can let me look for someone to call. And as I'm doing that, you are saying, oh God, let him not call me. <laughs> because you fear you might not sing as, uh, to the standard and might be rejected. You understand? Yes. When you go to a factory and they are sorting the good things from the bad ones, they are, they are rejects. Yes. Who never measured up to the standard? And many times when you don't measure to the standard, people reject us. We feel rejected. You know, I was born a long time ago in the late 50s. And uh, I'm told by my mom that, uh, actually I called her this week, last week, and I asked her, hey, mom, where did you meet my dad? And she gave me a story. She said, my dad had gone to teach. My dad is a, a Kipsidis, but my mom is a token. Those of you who know Kenya know what I'm talking about. <laughs> They speak the same language, but different dialects. So my father had moved to Maringo to teach. And while being there, he met my mother. Now my mother then, at that time, was a single mother. She had a son of about two years. And my father decides to, marry, to take my mom to Kipsigis, to marry her. And um, it's interesting because I'm just trying to, to, to step into my mom's shoes. She has a son out of wedlock. 
She's moving to a new community. She's under a lot of pressure. Because she wants to please this man. And she moves into the Kipsigis community. The Kipsigis community began to speak and say, Hey, William has brought a Tugen woman. Can you hear that story? And to make it worse, she came with a son who doesn't look like him. <laughs> so my mom comes and tries to settle down. She becomes pregnant and she feels good. Now I can prove to these people that I can also bear children for this man. Unfortunately, I'm told she miscarried. How sad. How sad. She must have experienced a lot of rejection because of that. She has failed to measure up. She's not productive. So she gets pregnant a second time in the late 57, 1957. And as she's carrying this baby, in her heart she saying, oh God, may this one work. I need to prove to my husband that I'm okay. Oh God, let it work, because if it doesn't work, I might be sent back to Tuken. The community is looking at her. Thank God. There was no miscarriage. Yeah. She gave birth to a son, yeah. and that's me. <laughs> <laughs> but the sad thing is this, when I was just a baby, my, my father decides to marry a Kipsiki's woman <laughs> as a second wife. Can you imagine the rejection my mom went through? Can you imagine the rejection I went through myself? I didn't experience my father's love. Yes, I didn't experience my father's love. My, my father didn't hold me as a baby to cherish. He was already focusing on another woman and starting a new family. So in that rejection and failing to get love and attention as a baby, it affected me. And I struggled when I was growing up. I found myself trying to please people. I was a man pleaser. Found myself having an explained fear. I used to fear things for no reason. I had low self-esteem. It really impacted my life. I want to share a story from the Bible that will be more positive than mine. Let's open 2 Chronicles, no, so the first Chronicles, chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. And you can give it to us in NIV for the change. I remember Pastor Joki said, let's make it simple. So NIV, first Chronicles, chapter 4, verse 9. This is a story which you are all familiar with. In verse 9 it says, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. Let's leave it. Uh, let's, leave, let's have verse 9, just verse 9 for now. I gave birth to him in, in pain. And the circumstances surrounding Jabez's birth or conception looks like it was a bad circumstance of sorrow and pain. And born, being born in pain, I don't think it meant pain, mothers, you can understand me, eh? I don't think it just meant a normal pain. See, every part of birth has pain included in it. Yes. Hello, is that true? Yes. Now I know, because when all my kids were born, I was right there holding my wife's hand, and I could sense, amen. <laughs> I hope the young people are getting money, have that. But I was there holding her hand, and breathing with her. I understand when you breathe, the pain becomes less. So I was holding her hand and breathing with her. 
until I heard the cry of the baby. <laughs> yeah, the last one happened 2002. That's a long time ago. But what a joy to hear that cry. Amen? Amen. But so I don't think the case of Jabez was that pain. No, no. It was more than that. It's a possibility it was more than that. It's possible that the circumstances were painful. It could have been she was, uh, he was conceived and he was in the womb during a time of war or famine. Or maybe a husband died. Can you imagine what happens? You conceive and the husband dies. So much pain. Or maybe she was just rejected by her husband, just like my mom. When I think about it, my follower, who is a brother, he is a serious yes man. He will always listen to you and agree with you. I've never heard him say the other around. Because he was born during that time when my father got a second wife. So we don't know what Jabez went through in the womb. Could have been anything, could have been a divorce. Anything, whatever the circumstances may have been, the impact was so strong on the mother that she decides to call him Uchungu. Can you imagine a child called Uchungu? In the Jewish custom, the name of a child determines the destiny of that child. So can you imagine the destiny of Jabez? A life of pain. Every time he was called Jabez, it meant pain, Uchungu. And it reminded his mother of the pain. But it also reminded Jabez that he was a, a pain to bear. Jabez would say, ah, I caused so much pain for my mom. I'm a burden. I'm not a blessing. I'm a pain. Can you imagine that rejection? So as he grew up among his peers, the word pain was constantly in his heart. And I don't know whether you can identify with Jabez. You may have lived all your life with rejection tied to your neck. And I don't know where you picked it up from. For some of you it was in conception, in pregnancy at birth, as a toddler, which when your parents left you because of divorce, or when your parents left you to go to work and left you with a, a house help who didn't care about you. For some of you, it was school life. I still remember when I went to nursery school in 1964. I remember so much. You know, things that impact your life, you can't forget. I was wearing a shirt which was long, reaching here, my knees. Those days, we didn't wear shirts. So that's what I was wearing, a long shirt with an opening, a slit on the left and on the right. And before I came to this school, I was a shepherd. I took care of goats and cows. So one morning I found myself in a stone building. You know, I, we lived in a mud house with a thatched roof. But one morning I found myself in a stone building, I still remember, with other kids like me. I remember the teacher giving me a pencil. Never seen a pencil in my life. Sharp. I even remember the smell of the pencil. <laughs> and I said, no, this is not my place. Do you know what I did? I left, went home, never came back again. Until the following year when I came to Standard One. Now, those are circumstances that can cause rejection. Because you don't fit in them, standard. It could have been sports. I remember when I was in high school, I used to play hockey. 
And so in the afternoon, during sports time, we go to the field with our hockey sticks, ready to play. And then practice for a while, and they say, now, let's form two teams and compete. So two people will be picked up as captains. And we'll be lined up, and then the captains will stand before us and call names, one by one. And of course, everyone is looking for the best. So when you're the last to be called, how do you feel? <laughs> Rejection. You're the, you're the weakest player. You don't measure up. Same thing happens in football and other sports that we all participate in. What about class performance? You're good in getting a D. Others were getting A's and they were being praised. Or the teacher was threatening you and telling you, you fail. This and this will happen to you. So those who did well were praised. Those who did poorly were mocked and laughed at. That causes rejection. Worse than that is when you go home and your parents want to see your report card. And your brother got an A and you got a D. And your brother is praised and you are rejected. You are rebuked. You are called all sorts of men. That's how rejection comes in. So every time you get rejection, it's reinforced to the previous rejection. And you find yourself, you are falling into a dark pit of rejection. It's getting deeper and deeper, darker and darker. Did you feel depressed and hopeless? Now, the story of Jabez, before I forget, something happened. In the midst of life of pain, being called pain. You know, names are powerful, eh? I hear children who are called Shida. I'm wondering, huh? You call a child Shida. Often worse, parents who call their children Njinga, Kumbaba. In my language, it's a word they use. They call Kosengeng. It means the one who mouth is open all the time. You know, when your mouth is open all the time, you look like a fool. And when your parents call you by that name, it's heavy. They go further and say you never amount to anything. Especially if you don't obey them. The words parents speak to their children can cause hurting. And the children can interpret it as rejection. Rejected. You will not measure up. But something happened to Jabez. That's why I'm coming to the conclusion of our message today. He called upon the God of Israel. Not just any other God. He called upon who? God. The God of Israel. He cried to him. In 1 Chronicles 4.10, he says, Jabez cried out to the Lord God of Israel. You know what he prayed for? He says, oh God, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I'll be free from what? Pain. You know, we have preached using this scripture many times, and what we are talking about is wealth, blessings, God giving you all that you need. No, no, no. We need to understand what Jabez was asking for. He wasn't asking for money. His concern was pain. You see, pain is a curse. And you don't have to remain in that pit. Just like Jabez cried, God can pick you up. So he said, bless me indeed, because pain is a curse. He knew he was cursed. Every time he would be called pain, it was a curse. And I'm sure he began to experience pain all his life. Pain of rejection. Pain of abandonment. Pain of being disliked by his own peers and brothers. So when he says, bless me, he's not asking for wealth or the health, or the happiness. When you are blessed, it produces wealth, health, and happiness. Amen? 
So blessed, when you are a blessed person, you have all those things. But blessing is not wealth or money or any of those things. So all this life you have has endured, this life of a curse. And you know pain or sorrow is a curse. It's not a blessing. So by God, by him asking God to bless him, Jabez was seeking to change the narrative of his life. You see, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And dealing with rejection involves going to the root of the problem. And you must approve that root and replace it with the root of love. Now, what's the root that causes rejection? Well, what holds the root network of rejection in place? Because you know roots are the ones that provide nourishment for the tree. So for the tree to stay upright and to be fed, the root network must be in place. Now for rejection, what is the root network that keeps the rejection in, in place? What is it? One of them is unforgiveness and bitterness and ungodly responses to, this, to rejection such as self-rejection. It's a lot of the rejection's cousins like fear, pride, critical spirit, mental sin, low self-esteem, depression, withdrawal, substance abuse, uncontrolled thoughts, suicidal tendencies to become part of your life. So as you allow rejection to dominate your life and your Feeling it with unforgiveness. You're feeling it with bitterness. Then you allow the other things to come and reinforce, such as fear, pride, critical spirit, mental risk, and all that. So that's why Jabez is saying, Bless me indeed. Remove the curse and replace it with the blessing of God. Amen? Amen. Then he said, Lay your hand be upon me. For what purpose? To guide him and to keep him from evil. You see, rejection is an offense that causes wounding of the soul. So he was saying, keep me from evil, that it may not grieve or cause pain to me. Offense is one of the tools the devil uses. Offense on your soul. And offense is a common thing. Hello? And you have to protect yourself from offense. For some of us, we are easily offended. You make a comment and someone is offended. You say, hey, you put on weight and <laughs> tears begin to flow. You mean I put on weight? They say, no, no, no. I didn't say you put on weight. I say, you're looking good. <laughs> you have to change the words. <laughs> there are people who are so sensitive to offenses. Very sensitive. And if you are sensitive to offenses, it means you are wounded. You need healing. For some people, you have to walk like you don't want to step on eggs. You might break them. Walking near eggshells. Wounding is a deep thing. And I know I'm just scratching the surface. I'm not going deeper because you don't have time. And uh, like Pastor Bukachi was talking about, inner healing is so important for every person that becomes a believer. Amen? So offense is something we need to protect ourselves against. For some of us, we're offended every day. Even an email. An SMS. You call someone, they don't pick your call, you become offended. Someone doesn't greet you after church, you become offended. Someone calls you a name you don't like, you become offended. You go home and your wife has not cooked lunch, you become offended. It's so easy. But we need to protect ourselves from offense because once you are offended, it becomes a wound in our soul. 
And when our souls are wounded, it becomes an opportunity for the enemy to come in and control you. Because offense causes rejection. In Acts 24, 16, Paul was saying, and herein do I exercise, King James, do I exercise myself to have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. Paul says, I exercise myself to be away from offense. Um, please give us that, that, that verse, Acts 24, verse 16. I exercise myself, that's so important, to always, not sometimes, always have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Acts 24, 16. Yeah, so I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. I wish you could get King James. This one is, uh, he's not saying what I want to say. Amen. Thank you, thank you, John. Yes, and in Third John, verse two, Third John, verse two, again King James. He's saying, "Beloved, I pray." that you may prosper in all things and, and, and be in health just as your soul prospers. He says, Beloved, I wish that you may be in good health. And prosper in all things just like your soul prospers. So when your soul is prospering, you will be in good health. Amen? When your soul is prospering, you will be, you'll prosper also. And for your soul to prosper, you must remain void of offense. Amen? Amen. For some of you left home this morning offended. It's so easy to be offended. In Proverbs 4, verse 23, King James, Proverbs 4, verse 23, that I believe will be our last uh, scripture. It says, guard your heart, or keep your heart, with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Guard your soul. Guard it with all diligence, because that controls your life. That determines who you are. The Bible says, as a man thinketh so, so he see. But guard your soul. Guard it. Keep it from offense. Keep it from being wounded. Guard your soul against rejection. That's what Jabez is saying. Let your hand be upon me so that you can protect and guide me from evil. That it may not cause pain. It may not cause offense. That is his prayer. And you know what the Bible says? God answered him. Amen? God answers prayers like this one. When you pray from the bottom of your heart, desperately, if you live the life of pain, what do you do? You pray with desperation, with faith. And God answered this prayer. And you know what? The conclusion of the whole thing, in the Bible says he was more honorable than his brothers. He was more honorable than his brother. The man who was called pain, Uchungu. By praying that prayer for blessings and God's hand upon him, the Bible says he was more honorable than his brother. Because God answered this prayer. So when your soul prospers and is void of offense, anything else will flow. Amen? You're wondering why you're struggling in life. Things are not working out for you. You're struggling with your health. Finance is running away from you. Let me tell you what the answer is. Your soul. Your soul is wounded. You're living with offense, which has not been dealt with. You could be living in bitterness and unforgiveness. 
And because of that, you have developed an image and no self-esteem. No service, a bad self-image. You think of yourself as worthless, useless, of no value. You are breaking yourself off. God answered this prayer. And he became more honorable than his brothers. So what's the key to deliverance from wounding of souls? As a result of rejection. I'll give you just three points as I close. Number one, you must acknowledge your condition. You must acknowledge your condition. And I'm sure you've done it. As I was preaching, I'm sure you, you began to identify with some issues. And you say, oh yeah, now I understand why. Oh yes, now it explains this. I'm sure you're beginning to see why nothing is working in your life. Every project you start fails. Why are you always fighting with your relatives? With your brothers, sisters. You begin to see why all these things are happening. So identify the root cause. Can you remember that time when someone rejected you? Despised you? When someone offended you? Like we were praying with our sister Purity. On your own, because she's been offended by her parents. They have not been there to support her. They have not found her feelings and her decision. They have not considered that she's an adult that can make a decision. So they didn't honor her, and that caused pain, offense, rejection. And one of the things I led her was to pray to, to forgive them. That's the key. You have to forgive. Okay? So you remember that situation? Forgive. Say, I forgive you for doing A, B, C, D. It's so important. Don't hold on to unforgiveness. The scripture that God gave, gives us in Mark, I think Mark, 11 by verse 23. Where, God, where, where Jesus said, what things soever you decide. When you pray, believe you receive it, and you shall have it. Now that's like an open, a blank check that God is saying, you can, you can write anything on that check, and you shall have it, as long as you believe that you receive it. I mean, God took a risk to allow us to use that scripture, because it works. But there's a condition in verse 24. Just check for verse 25. I hope I'm right. Hmm? Oh, that's 24. Okay, 25. 25 says, and when you start, start praying, what do you do? Forgive if you have ought against any that your Father which is in heaven may forgive your trespass. That's the condition for verse 24. So this verse 24, yeah. That's the condition for verse 24. You must forgive. So when you start to pray, forgive first. Don't ever think God will answer your prayer if you have unforgiveness in your heart. In Ephesians 4, I don't remember the, the verse, it says, forgive one another, even as Christ and even as God in Christ has forgiven us. It's so important to forgive. So that's a key, a very important key. You forgive. Amen? Now if you have been holding on to unforgiveness all this time, that is sin. Unforgiveness is sin. So one of the steps is to repent for holding unforgiveness. You know, when people say, I can't forgive you, they feel like if I forgive you, I release you. No. And when you forgive someone, it's not saying that what they did was not right. No. We are not saying they are right. No. We're just releasing them to the freedom of your forgiveness. It doesn't mean that you must go and have a relationship with this person. No. It just says, release them. Amen? 
Because if you go back the same person, what will happen? They will hurt you again. So you forgive. Then repent for what you want to and forgiveness. And then the other ungodly reaction, such as gossiping about that brother who did this to me. You know, it's so easy to gossip. You can say, sure, me. Imagine what he did to me. Huh? And the way he says he's a Christian. And you start saying so many things. Now we need to repent of gossip. The gossip against people have hurt us. We remove them from our Instagram. We block them, don't we? That's another reaction which is not godly. When you meet them, you don't greet them. You avoid them. That's an ungodly reaction. You withhold support. I mean, it's a big challenge. And forgiveness is where you take poison and hope the other person will die. And it doesn't work that way. The second one is to trust God is willing and able to set you free. And ask him to heal your soul and disconnect you from any ungodly soul type that has happened because of the events in your life that has led to rejection. So God is willing. When Jabez asked God to bless him and to let his hand be upon him, God answered. He said, yes. Let me tell you, God is saying yes to you today. He's saying yes. He wants to heal you. Amen? He wants to heal you. And remove any ungodly soul ties. Soul ties are ties between you and the person who offended you. And those soul ties are real. They are so real. You know, in the past, we thought that uh, soul ties are just because of two individuals who have been sexually been involved. No, it's more than that. Anybody you fought with, you disagreed with, you exchange bad words with, creates a soul tie. And that soul tie remains until we ask God to remove it. And when that soul tie exists, you find that the things of the other person will come to you. And then you find yourself losing some things from your life to the other person. It's a real time. So we need to ask God to cut it and God is all time. And then to restore what you've lost. And to remove from you what has come to you because of that ungodly soul time. And God is all time with your parents, whether they are alive or not. God wants us to have godly soul ties with our parents, with our children, with our friends, with our relatives, with our anybody else. Godly soul ties. But a godly soul ties causes problems. When there is a wounding because of a rejection or anything else, demonic spirits come in. It becomes a foothold. And they come to sit and influence your life and control you. You know what I talked about strongholds? Yes, that's how they come in. Paul says, do not give a foothold to the devil. So after you've prayed and you've forgiven, you've repented, you've asked God to cut it and God is so tight, you command any spirits, any demonic spirits to leave you. In Jesus' name. God has given you authority to cast out demons. Not just from other people, but even from your own life. Amen? Then thirdly, allow God to come into your life, fill you with the Holy Spirit, restore you completely, bless you, protect you from any offense, and be Lord over your life. Ask the Holy Spirit to come in and fill you fully and remove anything that the enemy has put in your life. Now, I, 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 I know I've summarized because time is gone, but this is so important. But the key one, above all, is forgiveness. 